Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, today we will be taking a look at chapter 19 of the textbook, The Fundamentals of Ethics, which uh, is generally titled Ethical Relativism. It is the first of the chapters that we will be exploring pertaining to pertaining to metaethics. Now recall that metaethics is an area of ethics that will actually skeptically analyze this entire ethical enterprise that we have done so far in this course. And granted, this won't be on the, on the test, but I thought I would mention this. Uh, when courses on ethics, I guess introductory courses in ethics are done, some textbooks actually begin the course with meta-ethical issues by discussing cultural relativism, and then quickly the approach is generally to show why it's stupid. Which means to some extent a lot of textbooks end up distorting the issue, setting up a straw man. I hope the author of the text, even though he disagrees with these meta-ethical critiques, I hope he at least explains to you why they are worth taking seriously. I assume that's one of the reasons why the author does it sort of in a reverse order. Recall he started with value theory that discussed, you know, various views about what human happiness is, and that was sort of a pretext for discussing what kind of things tend to motivate our behavior. And then there was the opportunity to connect our motivations to become happy, that is to live a good life and so forth, with other normative motivations. Anyway, just wanted to mention that for a moment. Now at the begin beginning of this chapter, the author introduces this concept of moral skepticism. Now to be skeptical generally isn't just being critical. The skeptic will contend that the knowledge that we think that we can have may not actually be something we can have at all. That is part of what skepticism will do. It will critique or question our ability to have a particular kind of knowledge. Now, this is not in the book, but I thought I would mention this right now. Many of you have probably heard of epistemological skepticism, even if you haven't heard that word before. Epistemology is the area of philosophy that pertains to knowledge and our ability to know. Most of you take for granted that you get your information about the world through your senses. Now, of course, the rub of this is you recognize that your senses are oftentimes deceived. In other words, you have reasons to believe that your senses may sometimes fool you. Thus, our sensory data can always be suspect to some extent. However, most of us presuppose that if we use our senses properly, we can verify certain kinds of empirical claims. For example, if I say, it is a clear day in central PA, Generally speaking, you would verify that statement by inspection. That's just fancy Dan for you look out the window and see, well, is it generally what we call a clear day or isn't it? Now, folks, the problem here is most of us believe that we can have, generally speaking, the truth when it comes to the facts about the world. That is empirical claims. <coughs> The problem is, guess what moral claims are not, according to all of the normative theories, except for natural law ethics. Moral claims are not empirical claims. They are what kind of claims? They are statements about value. 
Now, the question is, where do values come from? In general, these next two chapters will contend that perhaps values are not part of the fabric of the cosmos. Perhaps it is more right-headed to believe that values are things that human beings in their con context end up constructing. For example, we value motor cars because we value transportation. We value cell phones because we value communication and entertainment. We value education for various other purposes, hopefully to some extent for self-improvement and personal edification, and if nothing else, it's for instrumental means. Yeah, you want to get a job or something like this, get paid, and so forth. Now the argument here is that values are constructs. And thus, there is no way that we could verify them as being objectively true. Now, objectivity is juxtaposed here with relativity. In everyday parlance, if I say that, that it is relative to your perspective, what I mean is something like this. It is dependent on or determined by the particular observer who is making the evaluation or making the judgment. Now, the overarching topic of this chapter, as you see right here, is ethical relativism. Now, ethical relativism is lumped into two distinctions in this, or I should say. The author makes two distinctions about ethical relativism here. The first he will discuss is ethical subjectivism. And by the way, some other textbooks might call this individual relativism. And I'll explain why in a moment. The other one the author will discuss is cultural relativism. Now, generally speaking, ethical subjectivism contends that ethical judgments are pretty much individual value judgments. And what you hold to be ethically correct will determine by you and your own individual value judgments. According to this view, every single person has their own ethical viewpoints, which are right for her. And in a very strange sort of way, and this is sort of the anti-objectivity position, nobody by definition can be wrong about ethics. Why? Because ethics is a personal matter. And all you have to do is reflect upon how you think about things, and you will determine what you think to be ethical. Now, cultural relativism recognizes something different. This is one of the reasons why some people find cultural relativism to be more plausible than ethical subjectivism. Because cultural relativism explains that our realities are in some sense a social phenomenon. In other words, an individual is just not an island unto herself. An individual is born into a particular cultural context. Now, unsurprisingly, the culture that you come from will slowly but surely indoctrinate you into a particular way of looking at reality. Now, cultural relativism explains why within a culture, most people tend to have the same general moral views. And this is because it is socially imprinted on people. And I, I'll go for the easy example, which is not ethical per se. But one of the reasons why America is sometimes called a <coughs> sensibly Christian nation is because people were brought up with that particular way of looking at the world. Simply because it's a particular way of viewing the world does not mean that it is empirically correct. 
it is one culture's way of looking at reality. But yeah, cultural relativism appreciates the idea that, that people's values tend to be social and cultural phenomena. We tend to learn a way of valuing through our culture. And it also explains why people tend to have fairly homogeneous points of view within a culture. Now, both of these, now, I guess I better say this. <coughs> we will be discussing moral <coughs> nihilism in chapter 20. Now, as one of my more astute students put it a couple years ago, to some extent, the relativisms of chapter 19 already sort of presuppose the conclusion of moral nihilism. Now, nihilism, folks, you might hear it pronounced nihilism. Either one is actually correct, according to the American Heritage Dictionary. So whichever one you're into is fine. Nihilism or nihilism. It comes from the Latin that means nothing or nothingness. Moral nihilism contends that all that, I should say, that moral values do not exist out there in the universe. As a matter of fact, values are a wholly human invention or in beings like us. In other words, conscious, rational beings that make value judgments. There are no values in the universe. Values are human constructs. So to say that your values are right in some kind of objective sense, in a way, is to misunderstand what values are and how they are derived. There are no ethical truths according to moral nihilism. <laughs> now, folks, I do want to add this that the author does not say. Simply because the moral nihilist contends that values are not part of the fabric of the cosmos does not mean that the nihilist doesn't believe that there is a need for us to create values. Even if it is simple, simply for the purpose of keeping us from killing one another. Remember, social contract ethics does not assume anything about the nature of ethics except that we are rationally self-interested and that we ultimately want what's in our best interest. Ergo, even if ethics are not part of the fabric of reality, we still would have had to invent ethics according to social contractarian thoughts. Now, I've gone beyond what the author will talk about, just to make sure you're aware of this. Don't make a straw argument of moral nihilism. It's not saying, hey, man, anything goes. No, the moral nihilists is saying there are no absolute values out there in the cosmos. They're not saying that we don't need to create values. They're not saying that we might not need to construct moral theories to help us to make sense of the world and regulate our conduct. They're just saying that they are not part of the objective fabric of the cosmos, as some people have wanted to believe. Values are created. Values are constructed. Now, one philosopher whose name is not dropped here, who has been influential in this kind of thinking, was the late 19th century German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, in case you're interested. Now, just wanted to make sure we laid that groundwork for these next two chapters. Now, <clears throat> the author discusses some of the problems associated with both versions of relativism, and then we'll kind of come full circle and discuss this. Now, the author talks about what he calls the problem of moral infallibility. 
And by the way, some of these critiques that the author mentions may overlap with one another a little bit, admittedly. Now, the problem of moral infallibility goes something like this. By definition, nobody can ever be morally wrong according to ethical uh, subjectivism. Why? Because whatever point of view you hold is your view of morality. And if you change your mind and hold a different position, you might hold a different view of what's right. But you're still right, because why? Because by definition, whatever you believe to be morally right is morally right. Well, from an objective standpoint, that seems rather peculiar. How can both viewpoints actually have been right? <clears throat> Well, the nihilists would say they can both be right because one is your value judgment at one time, one is the other. They are just reflections of your value judgments. Now, in cultural relativism, remember that cultural relativism contends that it is the culture that determines what is right and wrong. Now, part of the reason why the culture can determine what is right and wrong is because people tend to be products of their culture and its, and its inculcation of values. Number two, and I'm going beyond the textbook here, the culture also has the power of enforcing values. In other words, if you are not a person who goes along with cultural norms, you will pay the price in one sense or another. You might get ostracized. You might be considered an abnormal. Or depending upon the severity of the cultural infraction, very bad things might happen to you. Now, since I'm on this, let me give you a couple of examples of cultural relevance. Well, I, let me wait. I want to make sure I run through these other ones first. Hmm. Yeah. The cultural... Uh, relativism that you're talking about. Uh, and then you say that there could be bad things going on. Isn't that something like kids? Say, say, say if you a person that smokes cigarettes. And you don't want to go along with that. Or uh, uh, say that you want to get a higher education and people that, that have lived in, in cultures where there's no type of education. When you decide to do that, your kids come at you. Yeah. So like a crab in the Or even worse, the entire institutional structure might come after you. Right. Let me go for what the, for I guess what we call the proverbial low hanging fruit. And this is because this is mentioned in the chapter and it can harken back to an earlier conversation. Most of us probably believe that the period of U.S. history where human beings could have been owned by other human beings, was a morally bad time. Far worse than that. We believe that the Western culture had gotten it grossly wrong when, when Western culture held the viewpoint that certain people could be owned as property. And we tend to believe that we have made moral progress by getting rid of that odious institution of slavery. Now, how did, the, how did the institution of slavery stay alive? Well, in part, it was because it was the law of the land. Many people mistakenly believe that the culture and the laws of the land also ought to determine what our values are. And I hope we take that viewpoint to the curb in the introductory chapter. And simply because something might be the law doesn't mean that it's necessarily right. What it does mean, though, is if it's the law of the land, that the institutions have the power to enforce it. So if you helped a runaway slave like Huckleberry Finn did, you were literally breaking the law. You were keeping poor Mrs. Watson from getting her property back. Now, Huck was in a quandary because he knew what the laws of the land were. But he also knew that Jim was his friend who he had made a promise to, a human being. Now, if the culture says that slavery is moral, 
according to cultural relativism, then it is moral where? In that culture. The same way that in cultures where female circumcision is practiced, I'll go for the other controversial example. In order to enter into the company of women and be marriageable, female circumcision in some cultures is something that has to happen. Now, we in the West refer to female circumcision by another acronym. We refer to it as FGM, female genital mutilation. I'll just say this other thing and then I'll leave it quick. I sometimes wonder why we don't call male circumcision male genital mutilation. Because some of us think that it in fact is, but it became so culturally normalized among some Westerners that we didn't think twice about it. And we also try to find every justification under the books to try to keep the practice going on. Even though it's medically unnecessary, and dudes, I'm not Jewish and I'm not Muslim. So one wonders why my parents thought it was so important. One wonders why my parents thought it was so important. Well, one reason why we probably don't call it male genital, genital mutilation is because the practice was just so normalized in the West. If female genital, genital mutilation were already normalized in the West, I doubt that we would have the same viewpoint about it. We would just think it was what? We would just think it was normal. We would just think it was the way things done things were done, and we would think it was therefore right. Now, one of the reasons why we think it's wrong, and I'm not saying I agree with this, is because we don't, in fact, do it. But if it were part of your culture, you'd probably what? You would think it was normal and therefore right. The same way we think that male genital mutilation is normal and therefore right. Now, folks, you may not agree that it's right, I don't think it's right either. And that's why we said what? This is why we said no to it. I am not going to go, my son was not going to go through his life constantly. For no what? For no good reason. And can anyone, yeah, my wife wouldn't mind this TMI example. I mean, we had this conversation. Is he going to feel uncomfortable in the locker room? I said, every young man at first feels uncomfortable in the locker room. So what? I said, keep in mind, simply because something might be the normal way to do things doesn't mean that it's right. And number two, our culture is in the process of what? Our, our, culture, was, our culture is changing. I said, the more of us who make the decision not to do this to our sons. Perhaps there will be a new, perhaps there will be a new normal. Because there is no reason why it is either right or wrong necessarily. Well, I would say it's wrong because of what? Causes unnecessary pain, and it takes something that is there, that some of us would say is naturally there for what? It must be there for some reason or another. Now, of course, some people or some cultures and religions did that as, the, as a symbol of their covenant to God. And as I told her, I said, we're not Jews and we're not Muslims. So I'm wondering why our parents continue to do this. And I think it's just because they're what? Their parents did it before them. Their parents did it before them. You get the idea. And ultimately, in cultural relativism, don't worry, I'm going somewhere with this example. Ultimately, with, me, uh, ultimately with cultural relativism, do you need a reason? No. The practice is the reason. 
Now that should be a problem for rational people. Because for rational people, guess what you should ask for? You should want reasons why this is a good idea. In other words, you should want some reasons to back it up other than this. If, it, if you don't let this reason float for other people's cultures, then you shouldn't what? Then you shouldn't let it float for your own. Simply because something is a long-standing moral, pra moral practice doesn't make it right. Is that pretty clear? I hope you didn't mind my going for the easy example there. Yeah, thanks for the question. I, it gave me a chance to lay that out so I don't forget to discuss it. Moral equivalence. Moral equivalence simply is this criticism. No matter what your moral point of view happens to be, it is equally right. Because according to uh, ethical subjectivism, your viewpoint is right by its very definition because it's what? Yeah, because it's yours, and all you need to make it right is your subjective approval or assent to something. Every culture's way of doing things is also morally equivalent. Different practices, but remember, every culture decides for itself what's right and wrong. Each culture is right for itself, no matter how different those cultures' beliefs practices and values happen to be. Now folks, the homework question that you were asked about was moral progress. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but I might be backtracking a little bit here, but um, while we were talking about moral nihilism, I had a question. Sure. Does the nihilist believe that there are some like moral values that are like better than others or um because you said that there's like no objective like moral theories or whatever so i was wondering like is some are some better than others or most of the people who i know who actively subscribe to moral nihilism are actually social contract parents most of the people who I know who actively say, yes, I'm a moral nihilist. I do not believe that morality is part of the fabric of the cosmos. They nonetheless believe that we would need to invent morality, mostly for purposes of mutual cooperation and living a decent life. Now, the critic might say, isn't that viewpoint, and I hope I'm not saying too much here, the critic might ask, isn't there subscribing to some value system at all? In a sense, maybe a rebuttal of their nihilism. They would say no. They would say it's this nature. As beings, we want to live, we want to be happy, so on and so forth. <clears throat> they wouldn't say that those are value judgments. They would say that they are just acting out of their... I guess they're, they're, uh, they're, they're human genetics, if you will. They would say that they are not values. I hope I answered that question all right. But yeah, admittedly, this, if I go further, it will go far beyond the, the context of a survey course, and I do apologize. I might have more fun than I ought to, but hope I answered that all right. Now, moral progress. There will be a question on the exam about this, unsurprisingly. There will be about other things, too. Now, the homework question asked about the concept of moral progress. Now, moral progress, simply put, is the belief that we can move from lesser or worse values to better values and practices. The low-hanging fruit example is from slavery to more human emancipation. 
Many of us would say that a society that if it went from not valuing human life very much to valuing human life more, that would be progress. Now, folks, according to ethical subjectivism, a.k.a. individual relativism, can a person make moral progress? The answer is no, because progress implies better and worse. And individual relativism or ethical subjectivism says, whatever you believe is right for you, no matter what it happens to be. So according to ethical subjectivism, no sense whatsoever can be made of moral progress. As a matter of fact, moral progress would not be possible because that suggests better and worse. And better and worse is just up to the what? It's up to the individual. Now, I may have misspoken. If I change my morality to a different way of doing things, I might say to myself what? Hey, I'm improving. But I would have no factual grounds by which to back that up because I have nearly changed my mind. Now, cultural relativism is a little bit stickier when it comes to this. Here's why. According to cultural relativism, a culture cannot make moral progress because all the culture can do is this. All we can say is that the culture changed, not that it got better. Because there is no better or worse, according to relativism. Now, here's the catch. According to cultural relativism, an individual can make progress. Does anyone know why? According to cultural relativism, an individual can make progress. I'll go for the easy and provocative example. If my wife and I were to get together and say, you know what, we screwed up. Let's go take our 16-year-old boy to be circumcised. We would make moral progress, according to most Americans, because we screwed up in the beginning when we failed to do the right thing. Because remember, young boys are supposed to be cut. If you live in a culture where young boys are supposed to be cut at infancy, and you don't do it, then we are the immoral people. Now, immoral means doesn't subscribe to common practice here. Now, most of us think there's more to morality than just saying doesn't subscribe to common practice. In other words, folks, we think there ought to be some reason to call something right and wrong beyond cultural conformity. That's some of our beat with this way of looking at morality. Now, one more thing, what the author calls the problem of contradiction. How can a person or a culture be both right, or how can a culture be right, no matter what point of view it holds? The culture was for circumcision. Now the culture is against circumcision. In both cases, the culture is right for itself. The critic would say, how can it be right when it holds what? Two different practices is right. That's what the author means by the problem of contradiction. It seems contradictory to say that the culture is right, no matter what it does. In other words, there ought to be something more to what we call morality than this. Now, as a side note, this is something the author does not talk about. There are some people who have written on this subject, James Rachels, who we've already talked about. In an essay he wrote, which is a challenge to cultural relativism, he also contends that one of the mistakes many people who believe in cultural relativism make is this. Not just all these problems, which he discusses. But he says, even though culture's practices might differ widely, <laughs> it does not mean that their values are necessarily that different. Similar values, different practices. And I'll go for the easy one. 
Even though different cultures have different burial rites or funerary rites, take a guess what the fact that they have different funerary rites also demonstrates. That each culture believes that it is meet and right to show respect for your dead. Even though we have different ways of doing it. I'll go for another example. Even though we might have different viewpoints about what it means to show respect to life, almost every civilization that has ever survived has had respect for human life. It's just that we have different definitions and conceptions of what counts as a human life that is worthy of respect. I'll go for the controversial example. Keep in mind, most insular societies have tended to think that only people from their in-group have actually fully found them as human beings. And if you hold that belief, then killing outsiders isn't really killing human beings. It's killing an enemy. It's killing a threat. This is, what, this is also one of the reasons that explains why even civilized people, as we call ourselves, during times of war, have been known to mutilate enemy corpses. You're aware of this, right? It's one of those things that doesn't show up in your US history book. It doesn't mean that someone who mutilates an enemy soldier doesn't value life. It's just that they were conditioned to believe that that person wasn't really a person. If you believe they were a person, then you'd have more of a problem with not just killing them, but you'd have a problem with cutting off a hand as a souvenir or something like this. But yeah, sometimes our, our definitions of humanity differ. Now we'll close off for today and in the next conversation we'll talk more about moral nihilism. Oh folks, I need a favor.